think the proportion in make of the shift away from the oversaturation of HMOs in traditionally residential areas. So for that reason, I'm inclined to vote it the vote against the proposal, but I just want to ask a question of the planning officers around the, maybe the adverse impact that this particular development will have on um, on on the light affecting the neighbouring properties. Is a point raising the objection from the officer on that? We appreciate it. If you don't mind, Councillor Lavelle, um, we'll leave that till the end when I normally have um, our planning officer pre present. But we'll yeah, remember that this this point that's needs. Fine answering if that's okay with you Fine, and thank you. yeah and i'll invite councillor radford to come back in on this one and i'm going to make a point that i think is valid on this as well but after councillor radford councillor radford thank, thank you very much chairman sorry there's a delay on pressing my buttons on the phone my apologies um the other thing that concerns me is whitland road is not one of the roads the larger properties where we have a problem of getting families to move in. It is a very traditional terrace street off Elm Vale with a very distinct community which is very settled. Uh, and I'm wondering whether is it proportionate to have seven students move into what is a basically a, a two up or a, a three bedroom terrace house? What community space is there for cooking and um, you know, socialising as students will want to do after they've done their studies, and, and is that the right property for it? And also, if any of them have cars, Whitland is actually on the corner with Whitcroft Road, and, and actually is a very narrow, tight entrance that feeds into the street. So one, more than one car parking could actually cause a, um, a, a visual congestion problem on that road. It's, I'm going to be honest, first, I know the road incredibly well because uh, one of my, um, two of my pressing employees lived actually on Whitcroft facing the property. And uh, one of your own former councillors lived over at number five. So um, I do know the vicinity very, very closely. So I'm, I'm really wondering if it is out of proportion, the number of students in such a small property. And with seven, is it realistic to believe none of them will have cars? Because I think the point's well made. I wanted to make one other point, and that is that possibly people don't realise this, but I did do quite a lot of work with students at the medical school and veterinary school at the University of Liverpool, and I do know that at that time they were moving out of Kensington, not because it wasn't convenient, they thought it was highly convenient, it was because of a lot of the problems that they saw in the areas around them and to social behaviour. So I think that I would accept George's point that students are willing to live there under the right conditions, but then other councillors have raised the point that local residents might not like the students being there. And we know that in Greenbank Ward, all this car parking problem has been immense. Um, but nevertheless, it is the planning committee able to determine who lives in a property? The answer very shortly is no. So I'm going to hand over now to the objectors. Chair, Chair, just to intervene briefly, we have councillors Hanson and Cummings who have now both indicated they wish to comment. Oh, yes, of course I must come in, but it's not coming up on my screen, Michael. That's the trouble. Um, so councillor Hanson first. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I'm used to being ignored. Um, looking at the report, um, it's got um, ground floor one bedroom, first floor three bedrooms, uh, second floor three bedrooms. We've got one bathroom to facilitate seven people, minimum of seven people, because uh, you'd expect on occasions the students would have people sleeping over and doing whatever, whatever, whatever. But it's equally important there is no cooking facilities. There is no kitchen in there on any of the floors. So here we've got a, uh, a government uh, pleading with the, the, the population to start eating healthily, to start doing whatever, whatever, whatever. Yet we have seven people who, in essence, will be uh, living out of takeaways, whatever, whatever, whatever. And the, at the point that uh, Councillor Bradford made, I don't know the area that, that well, uh, but again, um, is
reasonable to suggest that none of those students would have a, a, a car? I don't think it is reasonable. Um, so I think um, um, sort of being swayed towards Anthony Lavelle's position where I don't think I'll be supporting this application. I think it's a poorly thought out application. I think the, the developer is actually insulting to the, the students that will come in, into Liverpool and them to move into what does one kitchen down an area? Absolute nonsense. I really think the developer needs to go away and have a look at what he develops and if he's going to develop something, develop something decent for, for, for student, student populations to live in. So, Chair, uh, what I've listened to now, I won't be supporting this. Um, who, else, what, who else was going to come in, Michael? Councillor Cummings next, Chair. Yes, Councillor Cummings, if you'd like to make your comment or question, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will make it very short and sharp. I fully concur with the, uh, the verbal applications of Councillor Hamilton, and I find it uh, astounding that originally it was a six it was a six-bedroom uh, property, and yet you wanted an extra person to be in that property with the circumstances of what Councillor Hansen has just said. Now, Councillor Juarez, I can see you clearly indicating. So would you like to come in now? Yes, Chair. Um, I have a problem with this application. I think the property is too small to accommodate seven people, and you know we've just been through um, you know ex you know extraordinary circumstances where we've all been under lockdown in our houses, and you know being in lockdown with your family is bad enough, but you know seven people in a tiny house, and you know rattling around. I I think you know this is really not. Um, it's not acceptable for the government to expect this from people to rattle around and you know it, it would affect their mental health you know i'm just not going to be able to support this application i'm afraid the property is inadequate and it does not provide enough space for seven people to rattle around if there's going to be a, a further lockdown in the foreseeable future or we're going to have to spend a lot more time in our houses studying or working, I can't support the application, I'm afraid. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Now, I think we need to move on with this. We've got uh, at least four more people who want to speak. So I want to invite, first of all, Christine Sancerre, I think it is, followed by Jay McGann and then John Denian. So can we start with Christine, please? Chair, before we bring in our objectors, uh, can I just ask you to unshare your screen? I think you've inadvertently clicked on share. Just must make your viewing easier for colleagues. Uh, well, I don't know how to do that, so um, you'll have yeah, to stop me. Because I'm I had gonna, a lot of trouble. I'm going to take had... control back, Chair, if I can yeah. make. Yeah, I, I have my keyboard uh, motions open. And to get back to full screen to try and see everybody indicating, I've probably pressed the wrong button inadvertently. <clears throat> That should come on better now for everyone out here. That's not better, thank you. So are we going to get Christine to come on now, please, Michael? Thank you, Chair. I We have sent invitations, obviously, to those who are ready to speak. I don't believe, however, we have Miss Selsa present to speak today, or today's meeting, so I suggest we move to our next speaker, Miss McGann. Miss McGann, yeah. Would you like to come in, Ms. McGann? She is, she is present on, on the, the call, Chair. Um, can you unmute so we can hear from you, please, Jay McGann? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can hear you. Would you like to Sorry. go ahead? You've got up to three minutes. Hi, um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I wish to strongly object to the plans to transform this very small terraced home into a house of multiple occupancy for the following reasons. Liverpool City Council uh, previously made promises to restrict the number of HMOs in the Kensington and Fairfield Ward. 
feel that the decision to grant this approval will be incompatible with the council's previous um, promise to the residents within the ward. We are really highly um, overpopulated with HMOs, and this is probably one of the last roads within the, within the ward that doesn't have um, an issue with HMOs currently. And I feel granting this will open the door to other people to develop in what is a really quiet family road. Um, parking is also extremely limited and available, and converting a small terraced house into a seven-bedroom HMO could lead to severe parking problems. It could bring an additional, say, seven cars, up to 14 if you have visitors, and this would have a significant impact on road safety. I've got a disability and I have issues with mobility, and I already find it really hard to park in the road. Um, people have a multiple cars, and I think this application is ill-considered and doesn't take into consideration the safety fears and parking restrictions. Um, the ward is also one of the most deprived areas in the UK. The council made a commitment to regenerate this ward to help those that live in the area. Agreeing to allow yet another HMO will not regenerate the ward, but it will only serve to increase the levels of social deprivation within the ward. You only have to walk to the next roadbound model <coughs> sorry, to see the negative impact the HMOs are having on the area. The road is extremely run down. The properties are really unkept. Um, there's a lot of fly tip and a lot of antisocial behaviour. And this is the precedence to other people of non-local businessmen with no community ties, taking advantage of low property prices and, t and turning one of the only res remaining residential roads into um, a HMO. I've included quite a lot of um, reports and studies um, that, are, that support the, um, the claims the HMO do lead to a lack of social cohesion, cohesion, cohesion um, anti-social behaviour, increased parking pressures and reduction on com com sorry, community services and family homes. These were conducted by the Welsh Government um, and there's also extreme links between HMOs and the increase of modern day slavery and human trafficking with a lot of vulnerable people linked to these properties because a lot of transient communities and these are again are supported by the Gang, um, Gang Master Labour Association and also um, the Committee for Local Government. Um, in recent times, a lot of other police forces as well are rejecting um, bids for HMOs due to the increased levels of crime within the area. Um, I've read the recommendation report and a summary provided. I don't agree with the point made that the HMO will not have an impact on antisocial behaviour within the area. The author of the report obviously is not from the area and doesn't see the negative experience that we face on a daily basis as residents. I avoid walking down certain streets in the area because of safety fears. We're already in a really high crime area with levels of street prostitution and drug use, and the increase in HMOs is proven to cause rise in criminal and antisocial behaviour, and will increase the fear of crime within the area, and adding yet another HMO will only serve to increase the antisocial behaviour and criminality. Allowing the, the proposal to go ahead will be detrimental to the residents and would seriously impact community cohesion. Um, and sort of, I recognise that there's a need for HMOs in Liverpool, and I'm not disputing that. However, I believe that they need to be divided equally between all awards and not solely focused within Kensington and Fairfield like they are. We're already extremely overwhelmed and we don't need any more. As a local resident, we do feel quite like we're on our own and, we're, and our voices are not being heard. This application has received 12 written objections and a signed petition, yet the recommendation is for it still to go to head. As a, as a member, um, the board. We feel that you know, we, we need our views as local residents need to be put ahead of those of businessmen who are trying to profit on low property prices within an area. I feel that there is a view that there's a sort of a strategic abandonment or managed decline of the area, um, and we're not allowed to fall into further deprivation and poverty with the increase of um, HMOs. And this is all a detriment to the local residents. Corporate interest does seem to take a priority over local residents' concerns. And as somebody with community ties, I don't want to see our community go into further decline. I can see if this is granted in 10 years' time, there'll be no residential homes left in the area. They'll be taken over by student accommodation and HMOs. Um, and I'd like the council to follow up on the promise to reduce the amount of HMOs within the ward, um, as this is one of the, the few remaining family streets within the area, and we do risk losing them. Um, Again, I say thank you for giving me the opportunity to raise my concerns today, and I hope the committee will consider the impact on local residents when they make the decision. Thank you. Uh, can I now call oh, upon um, John Donnellan, and then I'll offer an opportunity for members to give any questions to the objectors. So, John, can you come in now, please? 
Hi, Jay. Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, Jay McGann just summed up perfectly my my feelings. Um, I've lived in the area all my life, um, and I'll be honest with you, there's been times recently I've got that depressed about this HMO culture that I've been thinking about maybe moving away, and I, I desperately don't want to do it. But that, that, that I feel I'm getting to a situation where I'll have no choice. Um, yeah. As I said, Jamie Gann summed up perfectly what I wanted to say, so that's all. Mel, are there any, other, any questions from members? Michael, I can't see anybody indicating. There, there aren't any further ones, Chair, but okay. we do have uh, Councillor Liam yes. Robinson registered to speak as well. So, um, Councillor Robinson, would you like to come in now, please? Yes, I certainly would. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I'm going to echo much of what um, other objectors and members of the committee have said, because on behalf of myself and my two ward colleagues, Wendy Simon, Sue Walker, and countless other residents that actually couldn't make today's meeting, uh, we're fully and formally objecting to this uh, proposal. As has already been said in the discussion, our area is already saturated uh, with a large number of houses of multiple occupations having a real negative and problematic impact right across our community it's leading to a much more transient uh, population in the area people not putting down roots and at its um, at one level that leads to issues with uh, rubbish and bin collections not being dealt with properly all the way through to more uh, acute issues like crime and social behavior noise and as some of the other speakers have already pointed out the issues of drug dealing and sex working in nearby streets all linked to hmo type properties we've got a real concern that another one particularly in one of the streets that has already been pointed out it is still very much a family family base street will only have a further negative impact right across our community. We also think this property is completely unsuitable for a seven bed HMO. This really is one of the worst examples of over development as a seven bed property. As other people have already pointed out, it's quite likely uh, that the residents, be the students or any other resident, I'm personally skeptical that all these students could have their significant others staying with them overnight. That could lead to up to 14 people in the property on some occasions. As was already pointed out by Councillor Hampton, the amount of bathrooms seems to be inadequate. Uh, fully acknowledged that there are two bedrooms that have got uh, ensuite for solid facilities, but that would still leave five bedrooms, fed bedrooms having to share one bathroom. So effectively, potentially up to 10 people on one occasion having to share one bathroom. We believe that's you know, completely uh, inadequate and absolutely unhygienic. People have also referenced the issue about parking. I notice in the report that uh, is before you, it says that there is no issue with parking. Well, uh, I have to say, if you've gone down that street uh, of an evening or of a night time when everyone tends to be at home, there is a significant issue with parking. And any of those residents uh, that may be living in the property having a car will only add to those issues further. So we have real concerns about that equally. My final point as well, just to keep things succinct, is that we also believe that the dormer that's proposed is particularly unsightly, particularly in view of the fact that this property is on the gable end of a terrace street. This isn't something in the middle of the terrace street that you wouldn't be able to see. It will you know, be something you can directly see when you turn the corner. We think that will kind of really negatively impact the visual amenity of the local street. Summing up all of those different points that others have already made, we strongly object to the proposition and would ask that this is turned down by the committee today. Are there any questions for Councillor Robinson? Yes, we have one here. Would you like to... Who's, who's coming? Is this George? Chair, the, the agents and applicant of Pitt would, would like to respond if the committee is agreeable oh, to that. Oh, I see. Yes, if the committee is agreeable, can we bring George back in, who's the applicant? Unless anyone objects, I'll let him come in. Would you like to come in then, please, George? Thank you, Chair. What I would like to say is that the poverty already used to be rented out as six pet seats. Now, one extra pet, 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 you know, pet is not going to make a big difference because they can go back and rent it into six pet seats. Now, you see, you, you have to see the impact one extra pet would do into the property. Now, six pets, they didn't have any sound.
isolation. They have a small kitchen. They didn't have any common area, and they didn't have any space for, for bicycles or cycling. We propose all this, as I explained in the past, you know, before. The seven bedroom is going to be in the dormer at the back with permitted development. The, 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 the client, my clients, are allowed with permitted development to have a full-length dorm planning permission. I reduce the site, the, the, the length of the of the dorm, thinking about the goodwill of the or, you know the the, 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 the neighbors, the neighborhood, and how the impact is going to have to the to, to the properties nearby. What I was going to say to you, I don't see too many students can afford any any you know sort of, sort of cars, even if the property it was rented out as a as a, a family home. It would have two cars, right? Every, every average family home would have two two cars. Now, seven students. I doubt it if they are going to have all of them one car. They go the students that can afford bicycles, electric bicycles these days, and walking to go to the bus stops. And the property is nearby to Envey, which is close by. And most of the of the houses there they are converted to HMOs. Is that what I want to say? And thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'm going to pass over to our planning officer, in particular, um, like you, John, to address um, Councillor Lavelle's question. I did promise to get an answer to. So, over uh, to you, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, uh, members of the committee and uh, people uh, viewing this. Um, Committee meeting. Um, my name is John Hayes. I am the team leader for development management um, in the north of the city. Um, Chair, you've obviously got a full report in front of you uh, that sets out the planning issues and your officer's uh, conclusion in relation to those particular matters. And obviously, this is a very familiar type of application to members of this committee. Uh, you've heard some very impassioned um, speeches there from uh, the, the ward councillor and from members of the public who are going to be affected by that uh, proposal. Um, and obviously, these are concerns that, that rightly you you have um, uh, raised on a number of occasions, and uh, and obviously are familiar, uh, as I said earlier, to to, to this uh, committee. I think rather than going through all the issues, what I'll try and do is go through the various points that have been flagged up by uh, individual councillors. Um, and uh, I think as part of that, it might help if we can get the plans um, back on the screen, um, particularly in terms of the um, some of the issues that have been raised about the internal uh, room sizes and, and the disposition of spaces. So if we can get those on while I'm talking, that would be really, really helpful. Um, so picking up on the issue of the dorm, a councillor Lavelle comment, he was concerned about the potential impact of light on the uh, adjacent property. Um, clearly, that's referenced, I think, in the report. The, the officer's conclusion here is it would not have an impact on light. I mean, it's obvious that it will be something that will be visible. Um, it will present a further structure on that roof of the um, of, of the property. Uh, but your officer's view is that would not be a harmful impact in terms of the amenity of the adjacent property. And as the agent has just pointed out, these are... Uh, ordinarily permitted development in any case, um, and therefore there's, the, the, there's little control. There's an assumption sort of built into the permitted development regime that these are um, acceptable structures. Um, so, so that's that's my comment in relation to that. Um, obviously, councillors um, uh, Radford and Councillor Robinson have raised the issue of the uh, impact of um, the number of cars that might potentially um, use the site. Again, that's addressed in the committee report. Your officer's uh, experience of these types of properties is that they tend to have uh, significantly lower rates of car ownership and that uh, where there are cars, they can usually be accommodated within the street without harm to uh, residential amenity or highway safety. Um, in relation to the overall numbers um, occupying the property, again, I accept what Councillor Robinson says. But again, your officer's experience is that the, um, they tend to be occupied on a, on a sort of one person per room basis. There may well be occasions where somebody stays over, but there is a condition on the recommendation 
that require a maximum of seven people to be occupying this property as their permanent residence at any one time. And clearly, if that was breached uh, by a more permanent accommodation, then your officers could investigate that and follow that accordingly. Um, in terms of um, the, the sort of wider impacts in terms of uh, the, the amenity, again, uh, as the agents pointed out, this could be uh, used as a six-bedroom HMO without the need for planning permission. Um, and so it, it's difficult to argue that the additional uh, presence of one further individual would give rise to um, harm uh, over and above that that might uh, currently exist. Um, absolutely understand the issues that have been mentioned around community cohesion and uh, the impact of uh, HMOs um, generally in, in, in the area. Again, I don't want to repeat what I've said on many occasions before uh, to this committee, um, that they are issues that we've, we've looked at through the local plan process, and there are areas identified within the uh, local plan going forward, um, which tries to limit the amount of HMOs, um, the Dales area is one, uh, and we're facilitating that through uh, Article 4 directions. Um, however, this particular area is not one that's been specifically identified as one of those three within the uh, local plan. Um, and, and so there is no policy basis uh, which you as a committee have to, to uh, re restrict this on the basis of an over-concentration of HMOs. Um, finally, Chair, if we could just go back to those plans, uh, just to pick up on Councillor Hansen's point uh, about the um, internal uh, spaces. Um, th there have been significant amendments since the application uh, was submitted. Um, the dorm has been pulled back slightly, et cetera. Um, and there's also been changes to the internal disposition of spaces associated with this development um, on the ground floor of the property, together with a, a, a small communal area. Um, and, then, and as you've got in the report, the, the, the rooms are as set out in the agenda uh, document. So you've got a, a, a bedroom on the ground floor, three on the first floor, and then three within the uh, roof space. Uh, and if you've got the plans available, I can't see them at the moment, but if, if you have got them available to view online, then you will be able to see that. You'll also see, Chair, that there is a yard area at the back which can accommodate a number of bins and in addition to uh, some cycle parking. So for all those reasons, Chair, we have recommended approval, um, subject to the conditions set out. Happy to answer any further. Are there any questions for our planning officer? Chair, I, I don't have a question. I just make a comment. Um, Councillor Bradford, um, I've got to take Councillor Conception first. He put his virtual hand up before. You can come in second. Uh, Councillor Conception, please. Thank you, Chair. Could I just ask John? In relation to these types of applications, I mean, we have seen them many, many occasions on this committee, and we do sympathise with some of the uh, issues mm -hmm. residents and objectors raised continually. But when you look at these applications, they do comply with all the policies that we currently have, don't they? They, and they refusing them, you know, sometimes our hands are tied in that respect. Uh, uh, absolutely, Council Conception. Um, Yes, and, and that's what the report makes clear. There are policies within the draft local plan where we're looking to try and improve the amount of general communal space, um, and, and, and this application um, doesn't fully meet that, uh, that, that, that new standard. But obviously, that is a draft proposal, and the amount of weight that we can give to that is limited at this stage. Our experience through the planning appeal process is that um, the planning inspectorate will uh, apply the existing policies um, to which this, as you say, uh, complies, um, and therefore um, w we don't consider there are grounds for refusal because it does comply with our planning standards and indeed our HMO licensing standards. Councillor Radford, would you like to come in now, please? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, John, I'm a, a little alarmed by the argument you or perspective you put that, well, if they would get an application, they don't need an application for six. So we, we should inherently accept that there's only an incremental change to seven. Uh, 
person could provide and might be waiting for the bathroom that they're sharing with five other flat dwellers. Um, so I can just share that comment. I mean, the other thing is, I mean, I, 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 I'll be up front. Hazel Williams, my former council colleague and Lord Mayor of the city, lives only around the corner, and I drive down to Elmvale virtually every other day or every third day. I will walk over to take papers. Elmvale is the feeder road for the estate, a road of approximately 80, 90 houses, all tight terraces. So to, I think it's delusional to suggest there isn't a parking problem there already. So how many how many car users would you expect from your seven prospective students or, because planning law doesn't restrict the students, although the applicants are saying students, they could be seven um, individual renters. There's no restriction on the, on the user type, rightly or wrongly. So how many cars do you expect, and where will they park? Um, Chair, through you, um, I, I absolutely understand the points that Councillor Radford has made. I, I, I'm not trying to suggest um, that you can't consider the application because PD would allow for six. Um, yes, that there, there would be an additional person, and Councillor Radford is absolutely right that this committee um, is absolutely able to take that further individual into account. I just wanted to make the point that there is a fallback position of six. Um, in relation to the car parking, I, again, I absolutely agree with Councillor Radford. Um, the permission, uh, if you are minded to approve the recommendation, I wouldn't limit the proposal to students. It would restrict it to an HMO of seven people. How it's then occupied is a matter for the um, the owner of that property. So you as a planning committee, we as officers, can't restrict the uh, occupancy to a particular uh, group. Um, Assessments around things like car parking are based on uh, our experience and uh, data that is um, uh, obtained by colleagues in the highways department. I can't give any assurance that this particular application will have a particular number of vehicles associated with it. That will be an impossible task. All I can say is these types of property uh, for multiple occupancy tend to have much lower car ownership rates than other properties. Um, and as I say, that, that, that tends to be our experience with the vast majority of these HMOs. But yeah, there will always be circumstances where perhaps an individual HMO is occupied by uh, diff different tenants who all have uh, access to a car. O unfortunately, as I say, um, planning has to make sort of broader judgments uh, and our experience is that the, 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 the car ownership tends to be a lot lower. Um, so I, I don't want to put a number on it, Councillor Radford. Um, again, highways colleagues might want to, to um, step in here as well, but my understanding of Whitman Road is even if there were occupiers uh, with cars, there is sufficient space on the street uh, for on-street car parking to take place. Um, we now have a question from Councillor Cummings. Um, yeah, um, I, w I would like to speak to the developer and he can just give me a yes, no response. Um, I would like to make a proposal that we accept this planning appeal if he takes it down to five people in residence. It's only, it's only a request to the developer and it's down to the developer to say yes or no. And furthermore, it's down to the rest of the committee to accept my amendments. Well, Councillor Cummings, I'm going to hand over to Michael Jones on this one because I think you'll find that this uh, is not legally um, binding. So could, could I have a comment either from the legal team or from Michael? Thank you, Chair. Just for the benefit of members present, uh, we as a committee and yourselves as members have to consider application placed before you on its own merits. There's no, uh, no ability to effectively create a new application and indeed as John Hayes has indicated previously with regard to permitted development rights if uh, there are six or under occupying this premises 
then that will be covered under permitted development rights and will not require an application coming before us. Therefore, unfortunately, Council Cummings, we can't consider the amendment you're seeking to propose whilst not commenting the merit or otherwise of it. We are unfortunately required to determine the application before us as it stands. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Chairman? Who's speaking? I don't see a, green, a yellow hand. Sorry, I haven't got a yellow hand on my phone. Okay, my it's Steve again. Um, yes, Councillor, come in. I think Michael's advice has been quite clear to us all, and we all should understand that. I think if David, uh, what I'd like to do is move an amendment to reject the application that will, in effect, um, create the situation the applicant can review the premise point, come back with a design to see which actually be a, a modest, uh, that is, I'd like, at some appropriate stage, I'd like to move an amendment to reject the application. I need to hand over again, Michael, now. Yeah, Councillor Radford, at this stage, the chair hasn't technically moved a resolution in relation to the application. Therefore, right. there's two options available. Either you can see move a resolution at this stage, and you, you need to be explicit in terms of the reasons, as may be the case for refusal. And obviously, if that's seconded, then that will be taken to the vote, subject to any other amendments received. Uh, so obviously, it's at that stage. Uh, just before you do seek to move that, Councillor Radford, I believe Councillor Hansen has indicated to speak firstly as well. So I would suggest we take Councillor Hansen first at this juncture. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Councillor Hansen. You've been invited to speak, Councillor Hansen. Would you unmute, please? Just to give the chair notice, I intend to move an amendment against the application chair. Um, that remains to move resolution. Just for purposes of clarity for all members listening to proceedings at this point, as, as I alluded to briefly before, the typical procedure within the committee is that we, having dealt with the case officer summary, the chair will sum up briefly and then move, seek to move a resolution to which members of the committee in turn, if they so feel, will move amendments accordingly. In this instance, to move and a resolution in either case, therefore we have two indications from councillors Radford and Hanson respectively, both indicating that either for councillor Radford, he seeks to move a motion to refuse, and for councillor Hanson, if the chair were minded to remove approval, then he will seek to move an amendment to refuse. With that in mind, therefore, I think the most appropriate course of action is to take Councillor Radford's motion to refuse first. And Councillor Radford, if you could please expand on the proposed reasons for refusal. Thanks very much for your help, as always, Michael. I'd like to move that having considered all the evidence in cross-examination by councillors and residents, the councils might, um, should refuse the application on the basis of maintaining sustainable communities in the Elm Park area, being predominantly residential community space of family homes, and we wish to protect that sustainable community. We should reject the application as being effectively overcrowding with inadequate bathroom facilities within the property, and we should refuse the application, noting that it is a gable end on a very tightly uh, congested terrace street of Whitland Road with Whitcroft Road, and that the, the further parking could create a, uh, a parking danger at this gable end. I think those are the three grounds of quite clear rejection I'd like us to move. And I'm, I'm doing that mindful of other councillors' comments as well as my own. Thank you, Councillor Radford. For, for, for purposes of ease and also for purposes of clarification, both for yourselves as members and indeed for those speakers present and for those viewing on the live stream, when we come to consider this resolution, in the event that the committee resolves in this manner to refuse an application, the effect isn't immediate refusal of the application. What happens is the resolution is taken forward in the form of a further report to the next available planning committee, which deals with the particular reasons for refusal as proposed by committee, and then it offers either a commentary and consideration of those, and if appropriate, very detailed formal planning reasons, if members are so minded to affirm their original decision.
So uh, just to confirm, Councillor Radford, and, and to, to paraphrase what you're seeking, and will have a significant detrimental impact on the character and sustainability of the area and local community to the point that that will then have a substantial negative impact on highway safety and an inad inadequate provision of internal bathroom facilities and associated parking provision externally. Would that summarise sufficiently for you? That, that's very helpful. Thank you as always, Michael. Thank you. Do I, does any member wish to second Councillor Radford's motion to refuse? I would like to second it, yes, please. Thank you, Councillor Cummings. We therefore have a valid motion for refusal and similar to the votes we've conducted for our previous items of business, I will go through members in turn. So starting with the chair, just to be clear, a vote in favour of the motion is a vote to refuse the application for everyone present. So chair, your vote, please. Thank you. Councillor Conception. Again. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Because this meets all our current um, policies and because not all students and not all other types of people either can afford to live a nice accommodation in town, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm against. Thank you, Helen. Councillor Cummings. Four. Thank you. Councillor Hanson. You're on mute, Joe, if you just unmute yourself to confirm. If you give a, a hand gesture, Joe, a, a thumption, thank you. That's acceptable and that's clear. Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Kennedy, can you hear us? Yes, I can, but I can't vote and I'm not taking part. Uh, okay, noted. Thank you. you. Councillor Maddox. Just reiterate your vote, please, Billy. Four. Thank you. Councillor Juarez. Four. Councillor Lavelle. Four. Please, Lavelle. Four. Okay. Just to confirm, in favour of the application, three members against, one member not voting by virtue of having a declared a prior interest. What this therefore means is a report will now come forward to the next available planning committee addressing the reasons stated within Councillor Radford's motion and putting these in the context of relevant planning considerations as to an appropriate reason for refusal if members are minded to affirm that decision. Next item of business, which is number nine on today's agenda. Sorry, pardon me, is number six on today's agenda and relates to the former bridge in public at number 162 Childwell Valley Road, Liverpool 25 in Belvale Ward. For purposes of clarity, we do have the agent present for this item who has a presentation. So if I ask members to bear, bear with us very briefly whilst I ask colleagues to display the presentation clearly on screen for everyone's benefit. And then I would ask Mr. Rainbird, the agent for the, the site, to uh, then address us accordingly. That's now visible on screen. Now, Mr. Rainberg, the address committee accordingly. Uh, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Good morning, Chair and members of the planning committee. My name is Tim Rainbird, and I'm the agent acting on behalf of the applicant, TJ Morris Limited. If we could show the first slide of the presentation, please. Excellent, thank you. In December 2016, Outline Planning Commission was granted on this site for the erection of a food store. Today, we're asking you to support your officer's recommendation to resolve to grant full planning permission for a new home bargain store. The site is well known, having been previously considered by this committee in March of this year. It extends to 0.7 hectares and is located approximately 450 metres from Belvale District Centre. It is principally occupied by the former Bridge Inn pub which closed around five years ago, and a William Hill betting shop, which is at least expiring.
As a result of its vacant state, it has become a magnet for including vandalism and fly-tipping. Should planning permission be secured, the proposed redevelopment of the site will make a significant contribution to the local area, including substantial public benefits at a time when the need has never been greater. Next slide, please. for home bargains of 25,000 square feet with dedicated access and servicing arrangements and custom car parking for 93 vehicles. A comprehensive landscaping scheme which respects the tree preservation order and replaces lost trees with larger, higher quality specimens. A significant package of highway improvement works amounting to around £250,000 of investment by the applicant. Relocation of the bus stop on Chilwell Valley Road outside the site and a new left-only HGV Next slide, please. The retail unit will be occupied by Home Bargains, the trading arm of the Merseyside-based, family-owned and run discount variety retailer, TJ Morris Limited. TJ Morris Limited and Home Bargains are household names on Merseyside, so they need little introduction. With over 24,000 employees nationwide and more than 550 stores, TJ Morris is continuing its rapid organic growth, often acquiring sites in areas where it already has an ex existing representation, which is the case in Belle Vale. Prescott in Knowlesley is a very good example of a similar situation where a new store was developed around 500 metres from the existing Prescott shopping centre store and both continued to trade successfully. Consequently, there are no plans to close the Belleville Shopping Centre store should planning permission be granted for this development. Next slide, please. The applicant has very recently met and listened carefully to the concerns of Belleville's ward councillors who are representing their local residents. Those discussions have led to several clarifications and suggested changes to the plans. These include reduced servicing hours, Whilst your environmental health officer was satisfied with the wider hours as set out in the officer report, Home Bargains has confirmed that it can operate its servicing arrangements within the proposed store trading hours, namely 8am to 8pm Monday to Saturday and 10am to 6pm on Sundays. We've also confirmed that Home Bargains will only trade for six hours on Sundays in line with the Sunday Trading Act. The plans include the retention of the southern boundary wall which sits at the end of the residence gardens to the south of the site. Inside that boundary wall on the applicant's land a two meter high closed boarded timber fence will be erected offering further oral and visual mitigation of the scheme. A revised landscaping scheme is now also proposed further enhancing the key corner of the site at the junction of Chilbal Valley Road and Kings Drive and finally Home Bargains has confirmed that it has no plans to close its former Belleville shopping centre store. Next slide, please. To summarise the overall planning case, as articulated in the officer report, we have satisfied all relevant planning policies. The principle of development is supported. There are no sequentially preferable sites. Planning policy dictates that no retail impact assessment is required. In any event, Home Bargains has no plans to close its Belleville shopping centre store. The proposal will lead to an overall improvement in cycle, pedestrian accessibility and overall safety of the local highway network. The landscaping scheme respects the TPO and mitigates any loss of trees. And residential amenity has been carefully considered and assessed and the interests of occupiers of adjoining properties will be safeguarded. Next slide, please. To conclude, the long-anticipated redevelopment of the site will deliver real investment in Val Vale, resulting in the regeneration of an unutilised brownfield site that has been subject to antisocial behaviour. At least 50 jobs will be created when the store is operational. In fact, home bargain stores of this size have the potential to create upwards of 70 jobs. Further jobs will be created through the demolition and construction process. Overall, the investment in the site will exceed £5 million. This is substantial and will result in multiplier effects to the benefit of the local authority. Importantly, this second Hope Bargain store in Belleville will increase consumer choice locally and improve residents' accessibility to discounted convenience goods. And should members endorse the officer's recommendation this morning, demolition of the site will be progressed quickly with the new store operational in 2021. Thank you.
Are there any questions? Councillor Cumming seems to have his Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, I have two issues about this proposal. Um, my first issue is, should this proposal go forward, uh, could you guarantee local contractors will, will take on this, um, this job of demolition and building? And two, what is, the, what is the circumstance in the context of this proposal moving forward and it's up and running when deliveries will along to the, uh, the establishment? Will it be very early in the morning or very late at night? And I have an issue about noise issues. With regards to local contractors, um, as with any um, contractor appointment, we will have to appoint um, available and, and free to undertake the work and we'll obviously go to a, a local base as well as a more um, regional and nationalised base of uh, contractors to ensure best value. Uh, but as far as possible, local labour will be used. Uh, it still has to be commercially uh, viable to do so. And on the servicing hours, um, whilst the Environmental Health Officer 11pm Following discussions with the board councillors, we've now reduced those hours uh, to, to be proposed as a, as a new planning condition, which is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday. And Sundays, days, which aligns the trading hours of the store. So previously, wider hours were proposed, but uh, TJ Morris can take deliveries here within store trading hours to limit the disturbance for residents to the south of the sides and to the west. Right, so that's within the sleeping hours the deliveries will come about. Right, thank you. Now, um, Councillor Thompson is not going to be voting on this, um, but we did allow Councillor Juarez in the usual way when she wasn't voting. So I'll invite your comment, Councillor Thompson. Um, my, my hand was actually raised in it. Well, I thought I'd lowered it. I raised it at the beginning just to remind everybody that I had declared an interest. So oh. I don't have a comment at this stage. Okay, thank you, Councillor Thompson. So it's Councillor Kennedy and then Councillor Hanson. Councillor Kennedy, please. Uh, I'm interested in the comment that the um, home bargain store within the local shopping centre is not going to close. I'm just wondering what the rationale for that is, because one of the things in the report uh, is about the economic danger of the uh, shopping centre, which has already got a number of empty, prop, uh, empty outlets. Uh, um, so what is the rationale between having the one on the corner and the one within the centre? Shall I take that question, Chair? Sorry, I've had to unmute. Yes, please. Sure. Um, so so the, the rationale um, is that um, TJ Morris's uh, business model does allow them to often trade two stores in relative proximity to each other. So I, I referenced in my presentation the example um, in Prescott, which is um, pretty close to where we are here. And um, in that case, we have Prescott Shopping Centre store. Uh, and we had a proposed out of centre retail unit similarly sized to that that is proposed on the junction of King's Drive and Chubble Band. And um, following the grant consent for the new store out of town, the erection of that store, the existing town centre store continued to trade. And I believe Prescott Shopping Centre and Bellevale Shopping Centre are not indifferent insofar as they've both struggled with vacancies over the years, but home bargains. Um, continues to trade in both locations. Now that's anticipated uh, here, and um, the commercial rationale is that the business model allows that to um, to happen. Now, Councillor Hampson. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Chair. It, it, it's a comment. If, if you remember back in March, there were a, a number of issues, a number of objections come from local councillors and local residents, and um, what, one of the things that we asked as a committee that 
the, the, the organisation went and had conversations with the local councillors and the community to try and resolve the uh, the, the, the outstanding differences uh, that was that, that were not allowing this um, application to, to move forward. And, and, and again, it, it's perhaps a lesson that we need to be sp speaking to other developers about the importance of having those conversations with local councillors and local residents to try and alleviate any issues and problems prior to them getting to committee. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted uh, that the home buyers have been able to come here today and say those issues uh, have been resolved. So thank you to both um, home buyers and thank you to, to the local councillors for getting around the table and resolving the, those outstanding issues. There's only one sort of concern presupposing this application is is um is passed today is in relation to the the, the, the bridge in and the as you pointed out the the, the ISO uh, that that is creating within the area and could i ask or could i request uh, that you as an organization look to very very speedily get on site and get that knocked down um because it it, it is creating issues for not for yourselves but also for the local councils and residents in the area and i'll, I'll close on that point here um, I don't seem to have any other questions for Tim Rainbird, so thank you for coming along, Tim. Now, excuse me. A pleasure, thank you. Okay. Um, so now I invite every landlord to speak um, in objection, who's the agent, I believe, for a number of residents. Edward, would you like to come in now, please? Would you like to unmute? Mr. Landor and come in. Yes, hello. Would you like to deliver your presentation? Uh, good morning, members and chair. My name is Edward Landor. Um, I act on behalf of Vale Local Business Association. The association represents local businesses in the area many of whom have premises at Belleville Shopping Centre. Um, I addressed the Planning Committee at its meeting on the 10th of March when members voted to refuse the application. The application was reconsidered on the 31st of March during the lockdown period and the minutes report at the applicant's request. Um, these are challenging times for the retail sector. The high street is under great pressure. Store closures and job losses are a daily occurrence and the current health crisis brings more problems. These pressures have intensified significantly in the current pandemic. The high street is much loved for the vibrancy and vitality it brings our cities, towns and suburban centres. Vale Vale is the high street equivalent in this area. It's designated in the current and emerging local plan as a district centre. The policy in the old and new plan is to enhance and maintain existing centres. There are at least 11 units vacant in Belleville Shopping Centre. It is vulnerable, exposed to adverse market pressures and less resilient to challenging market conditions than centres in more affluent areas. The trading environment is significantly more challenging in the post-COVID era. All the applicants' retail assessments, vacancy rates, retail impact analysis and sequential assessments were undertaken in July 2019. That's over 14 months ago. Market conditions have dramatically changed since. And if these were assessments were for trees or ecology, they would be regarded as out of date. Um, vacant shops and boarded up retail units and increasing number of charity outlets are evident everywhere. Belleville Centre is particularly vulnerable, not least because the applicant currently occupies a unit in this centre. Belleville is an example where planning policies are designed to protect communities, people's livelihoods and access to services should be rigorously applied. Nevertheless, it's proposed to grant planning permission for a large format store with 100 car parking spaces targeting care, uh, car travelling shoppers. In the light of climate change and carbon footprint concerns, this is highly unsustainable. It's proposed to grant planning permission for a large format store in an out of approximately 500 metres from Belleville Centre. Thus, the prospects of linked tri uh, shopping trips between the proposed store and the centre are most unlikely. In 2016, a wide-ranging planning consent was granted.
a variety of uses on this site. Draw public house, offices and bookmaker. This was an outline planning commission with all matters reserved for subsequent approval. Places consistent permission for such wide ranging uses in a primarily residential area was somewhat controversial. The application before you seeks approval for a large non-food store without conditions on the class of goods that may be sold from the premises. The report in front of you is comprehensive and well executed in many respects. However, some vital issues have been ignored. There is no reference and designation of Bell Bell as a district centre and no reference to UD policy S7, which seeks to maintain and enhance designated district centres. Without reference to such matters, the report is incomplete and easily misconstrued. Um, to disregard your planning officer's recommendation is a big step, but there are overwhelming reasons why planning policy ought to be rigorously applied in this case. Thank you very much for your time. We have a question from Councillor Cummings, followed by a question from Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Cummings, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Edward, um, I, I know the Belleville shop in, uh, it opened up in the early mid 1970s. I've probably been there for a long time. So my question is this. I, I, I understand your arguments, and I'm not against your arguments. I'm just asking a question with regard to the centre itself and where Home and Bargain is based in the centre. Um, as I mentioned in March, I was of the assumption that they could utilise the other empty units within the centre, although I'm, under, I'm of the assumption that those uh, units are sporadic and intermittent and they can't, cannot be merged together. Am I right or wrong in that question? Well, I think obviously in merging units together always uh, produces, um, you know, design, there are design issues when you try and merge units together where they are, and it may require relocating some stores, yes. So there are always some challenges, uh, but I don't, I, I, in my opinion, I don't think it's an impossible feat. It can be achieved, but there has to be a will, and it is a matter of commercial negotiation. I accept that. Councillor Kennedy, would you like to put your question now, please? I think Mr Landor is getting to the real basis of whatever concern I may have about this application, but the question I would ask for him, ask of him, is what is his concern about this particular company opening another outlet if it is maintaining its current outlet in the shopping centre, which I happen to know very well because it's very near where my mother is in a, a residential home. Um, so somebody who wishes to shop at home and bargains can either go in the centre and go in their unit there or may go in the unit that is proposed. If they go in the unit that is proposed, who are they taking business from um, other than the home and bargain centre within the, the actual shopping centre? So it seems to me that uh, your concerns may be, I mean, I'll give you, you have an opportunity to respond, of course, um, may be more to do with competition than they are to do with loss of trade from the actual shopping centre. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Um, th those are well-made points, and obviously it is a comfort that the Home Bargains has indicated that it will operate with uh, both uh, both stores in place. Um, but, of course, there are no guarantees, are there? That's their position today. Um, it is true that um, primarily trade draw uh, to the new store will presumably come from their um, e existing outlet in Belvale. And uh, clearly they will assess how, you know, the impact on competition on that store and the viability of that store in the future. But it's not a guarantee that the store is going to be uh, remain open in perpetuity in the centre. 
obviously that's a matter that they'll review and I'm sure it will be reviewed. Thank you. Um, there don't seem to be any further questions. So and if somebody um, uh, yes, Stuart, I I'm going over to you now. So I'm going to hand over to our planning officer now, Stuart Park. Thank you, Chair. As members will recall, this was originally um, placed before them in March earlier this year uh, with a recommendation for approval. Um, a member's resolved to refuse, which was predominantly loss of green space, impacts on residential amenity and highway safety. Those uh, three matters are dealt with in an addendum to the report. Uh, it's the first three, four pages in your uh, on pages 74. 77 of your papers and um, which deals with all of those issues in turn um, your office is still satisfied and um, that the scheme is acceptable with regards to all of those proposals um, in, in so far that it's capable of being approved in terms of the residential amenity side of things you've heard from the applicant that they've agreed to reduce the servicing hours to eight o'clock at night um, it's worth remembering as well that this this that this premises is, is, is lawful use as a pub so it could technically operate unlimited because it's not a restricted um, hours facility. Um, so this would actually bring the hours that it could operate to down. Um, so the reasons as to why your officers still consider it's acceptable are detailed in the report. Um, in terms of the specific comments made by Mr. Landor, I'd refer you to your table comments um, where we, we address some of the issues that he raised. Um, but basically, what, what we need to understand about retail impact is that this store is of a size that currently doesn't require any retail impact assessments. Um, so we're not actually allowed to consider the impact uh, on, on trade draw and things like that, even though they, they undertook such an exercise. Um, sequentially, they've gone through that process it let, it's, it's within 14 months. Um, as as I think Councillor Kennedy touched on it about potential for working units around to create bigger units. In the real world, that's that's very difficult to do because different shops and businesses will have different length leases, so they will all come up at different times. So it's not really reasonable for a shopping centre to hold units back and not lease them whilst waiting for other leases to come on board. So we're satisfied that the sequential test approach is still valid. Um, and, and that there's no sequentially preferable sites that could accommodate the store. In terms of the two policies that um, Mr. Landor references, again, I'd refer you to your tabled note. But policy S5 identifies district centres across the city and advises that we'll ma maintain uh, vitality and viability when considering out-of-centre proposals. That's primarily dealt with under S12, which deals with out-centre retailing. So we're satisfied that for the reasons I've said, you don't need to, to do a retail impact assessment for a store of this size. But the, that, that policy is, is, is dealt with through this note and through the original report. In terms of policy S7, that talks about maintaining and improving existing centres. But that's primarily aimed at enhancing the appearance of accessibility to them, as opposed to the retail impact side of things, which S12 deals with. So, so we're happy that, that the, the report is sound and deals with all the relevant issues. Um, and for the, for the reasons stated in the report, Chair, we're still happy to recommend that the application be um, approved. I'm aware that the applicant, following conversations with the councillors, has submitted um, some, some amended plans that, that um, for example, plant some more trees and things like that. Um, so if members are minded to approve, uh, we will need to tweak two conditions that are in your papers at condition two and condition 20 but i can provide the relevant wording to mike jones if that's what members would like to do i'm happy to answer any questions sure well we seem to have a question from councillor cummings and as he hasn't put his virtual hand down uh, I'm uh, uh, thank you i'll, I'll, I'll do my question now um uh, what i see here is um Home and bargain, undermining the shopping hub of the Bell Bell Shop in the centre. As, as what Charles 
false, Dad. Uh, the statement of no plans to close uh, shop, but well, we've all heard in many spheres we have no plans to to do what to do this action. And um, main viability, as you said before, well, I, I, I don't think this action maintains the viability of uh, Belleville Shopping Centre because there are, there are no guarantees that that shop will close in Belleville Shopping Centre. And with regard to the plot that they want to use, that can be utilised by many other providers, easily utilised by many other providers. So on, on those issues, I'm not going to support this proposal. Chair. Yeah. Bradford, who's trying to come in here. Yeah, if you don't mind, yeah. Chairman. Yes, that's all right. It's just the trouble is that you don't have a virtual hand appearing and you don't have your photographs. So I can't see your actual hand going up, Steve. Well, but but yes, you can ask your off. question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the questions I always ask myself when dealing with a controversial application. Um, uh, setting aside any arguments that we can't entertain, we can't refuse or approve something because of the arguments of competition. I think we're all quite clear on that. But, but the question I always ask is, if we didn't approve this application for the site, what would actually be the realistic prospect of what would happen with the site? Will we continue to see a continuation of the direct pub? Will we see an HMO? Will there be another retailer? From our officer's advice, if, if there was a refusal, and I'm not suggesting there should be, uh, because if anything grounds of competition is ground for us to do a refusal anyway. Uh, what are the risks? What are the realistic prospects for the site if his application didn't get approved? I'll hand over um, to directly to you, Stuart, to answer that one, please. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in terms of what would happen to the site, um, that, that's really only a question that the, the site owner can answer because he would control the site. We can only react to proposals that are put before us. But it, it's, it's not beyond the realms of um, possibility that a, an application, I don't know, for a HIMO or something like that, may potentially come forward for assessment. And, and clearly, if it's compliant with your policies, and was approved, then there's a possibility that that may, may come to fruition. Um, but it, it's very much crystal ball gazing, um, I'm afraid. Um, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, you, you've got, I know the owner controls the site, but from your knowledge as, a, as an informed person who's in the locality, what do you think would be the probable aspect? On, on a judgment call of, you know, if this application is in the brew, what else can we envisage would happen? It's like, from the experience that you have, I mean, you would probably have more experience than most of us in that part of the city. I'm sorry. Um, Again. I feel that, you know, if you said that we've got to consider the applications that are in front of us, always by planning committee. And I, I don't feel that it's appropriate that we should be speculating about what might a commercial interest might, another commercial interest might come forward. I, I, Unless Michael Jones is prepared to pull me out of order, I would say this is not appropriate to our considerations. Thanks, we have Chair. Counselor. Yes, all right, come in, please, Michael. Thanks, Chair. The, the limit on what can be said essentially would be that, as with any other application site, in the event that we didn't improve a particular permission at this point, it will be open for third parties, including the owners of that site, to potentially bring forward other proposals, at which point we would then have to consider them on their respective merits. But as to what the nature of those proposals will be, that will purely depend on the considerations of the individuals or organisations who chose to make such applications. Right. And now it's Councillor Moana Juarez, followed by Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Juarez. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the, uh, the, the proposal uh, to me seems, um, you know, seems fine i don't really have a problem with it you know the location is is in uh is in need of regeneration you know this uh that building empty for five years i think being empty for five years it can't 
it can't be left in that state, you know, as an, as an eyesore. Um, you know, Bellevale uh, Shopping Centre is quite busy. You know, when I go there, sometimes it's quite difficult to find a car parking space. Um, you know, it, and also, um, you know, you know, shopping centres go through um, periods of change, and sometimes that change has to happen. You know, maybe in Belvale, there's been times where too many un units have sold similar products. So, you know, uh, I don't think you can blame Home and Bargains for that, you know, that another unit sells very similar stuff to them. But, you know, which I think uh, there is a problem sometimes accessing the uh, shopping centre uh, via the car park because the, there is a shortage on certain days. Uh, I think, you know, the unit, the, 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 the former pub, that needs to be regenerated. And I don't see any other options in, in the future. I don't think we can sit here and wait another five years to... Uh, for somebody to come up with a proposal to regenerate that unit, I think you know. To me, it's that uh, I'm not going to uh, sort of reject the application because I think it makes sense that you know this level of investment is uh, carried forward today. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Kennedy, I think. You need to unmute. I cannot hear you. Oh, beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. It's not often I uh, make reference to what somebody else on the committee has said, um, but I will address what Councillor Cummings said in his uh, rationale for voting against this proposal. What he said was um, that home and bargains were undermining uh, the local district shopping centre, um, but then indicated that there could be other providers <coughs> on the site for which planning applications are being uh, the planning application is being sought. That indicates that Council Cummings may have been happy if it wasn't home and bargains uh, making the application, but some other commercial enterprise. So my question for Stuart Clark is, is the identity of the actual applicant ever a reason for voting against a planning application? Thank you, Chair. Um, um, in the, um, no, you, you, what you're considering is the use, and it's a land use. And that, that, that will run with the land, regardless of who the operator is, whether it's Home Bargain, m and Tesco, Morrisons, whoever. So you're not being asked to consider an application by Home and Bargain, even though they are the applicants. You're being asked to approve a retail use on the site. And, and I think it might just be worth at this point just to try and clarify a bit on the retail impact side of things is as a council, um, in terms of national policy, there's a limit of two and a half thousand square meters that triggers the need for a retail impact assessment. And we as a council consider that too high. And as part of the local plan that's gone forward, we are recommending, as we're allowed to, is to reduce that trigger down to a different level. And we are currently proposing 300 square meters. The problem that we have is that the local plan hasn't been adopted yet. So we are bound by national guidance, which means we can only seek and assess retail impact currently at two and a half thousand square meters. This store falls underneath that limit, which is why, as you've been advised in the report and previously, we're not allowed to currently consider it. Now, in 12 months' time, if the local plan went through and the planning inspector agreed that lower trigger, we would be in a position where we could legitimately um, take that assessment and use it uh, as a reason for approval or for refusal. But as we sit here today, um, current national policy means we have to default to the MPPF figure of two and a half thousand square meters um, for the for the trigger for retail impact. Thank you, Stuart. That's very
So what's happened? Uh, the site has been empty now for five years. So I've, I struggled with the concept from Councillor Cummings that there are sorts of people falling over organs and uh, developed else. No, the, the, the reality is that is not the reality of what Councillor Cummings is talking about. In, it's, in terms of if we reject it today, I would ex expect that that the the um you'll challenge that special title, it will attract more vandalism, anti social behaviour, and I saw to the, the community that lives in Belle Vale. I also think that it's fairly disingenuous uh when a, a, a business comes along and says we intend to keep um the store in Belle Vale open. And to keep that keep the uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'm not going to talk about individuals because um, I think that's uh, quite trivial. Um, one thing I want to one, one thing I want to state again uh, is come back to Stuart and say that this planning application is for retail use. Because um, others have said I'm I'm against home and bargain. I'm not against home and bargain. This is a retail use. So my response to that retail use application is this. Why have a retail use application for that plot of land when there is a hub from 200 to 300 yards down the road been established there from the 1970s? That, that is my question. Second point is what I said about no plans. Right. Well, anyone can say, I have no plans to do this, that, that. A definite statement. In fact, that is very. The city range, the city centre was not necessarily the most accessible location, but that in itself doesn't preclude the centre. As long as the applicant can satisfy the instance, there is no obligation to do so. Framework triggers, and that sequentially, there's no unit within those centres that could accommodate store of the size they're proposing. Then that removes any reason for, for not forcing them, but for, for saying that they would have to locate in that centre. And they've done that, um, and we've assessed that, and we're satisfied that there are no sequentially preferable sites in the centre that could accommodate a store of this size. And then, as I've said before, there's no... from two and a half, two and a half thousand metres to 300 metres. So we sit here today, we're bound by the... Um, and that's the trigger, the retail impact that we have to consider. Uh, and whether we like it or not, um, they don't need to do it and we can't consider it. Um, so that's the answer to the first one. In terms of the second one, um, you, you're right, uh, you contain a presence in that centre. I can't answer that question, I'm afraid. That's only a question that Home and Bargain can answer. Um, but it, it's not unusual for multiple for stores to have multiple units. Um, in a, you know, there's two in the city centre, for example. There's one in Lord Street, one in St John's that trade quite happily. Um, but but that's more of a matter for for home and bargain transfer as opposed to myself. I think. Now, seeing no further questions, I want to move to the vote. So, can I move 
that the recommendation be approved. Is that agreed? Thank you, Chair. Just before we do conduct a vote, any members wishing to, wishing to move an amendment to that at all? If so, now is the time. I would, please, Mike. Go on, Councillor Cummings. My amendment would, would be um, to request uh, the planner to go back to Belvale uh, and the management of Belvale to try and seek um, arrangements to, to use the uh, the uh, the empty, the empty units um, over a period of time where they could they could use those units the same amount of uh, and in turn that would support the hub, the shopping hub of the Belfast area. Thank you, Councillor Cummings. Unfortunately, I'm going to uh, rule that amendment out of order for the simple reason that it doesn't address the particular application before us and instead deals with alternative sites which are not actually subject to the application before us. Okay. With it on in mind, I will now revert to the uh, Chair's motion before us, the effect of which will be to approve the application. Therefore, taking members vote in turn, those in favour for, against or abstaining, please indicate when I call out your name. So first, the Chair. Thank you. Councillor Conception. Thank you. Councillor Cummings. Yes. And will you register, please? I will do. Thank you, Councillor Cummings. Councillor Hanson. <coughs> Four. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy. Agreed. Thank you. Councillor Marat. Four. Councillor Lavelle. Three. Councillor Juarez. Four. And lastly, Councillor Radford. Uh, agreed. I'd be delighted if they want to open a store in Tubrook. <laughs> Thank you for your comment, Councillor Radford. <laughs> Just to confirm the outcome of the vote, that is eight members voting in favour, one member voting against, one member not voting by virtue of previous comments on the application. That therefore means that the application is approved subject to the additional condition revisions as referenced by the case officer and which will be reflected in the published minutes. Moving on with our items before us today, as you will call at the start of proceedings, I confirm that agenda item 7, in respect to William Jessup Way, have been withdrawn from consideration today. We'll now, therefore, move straight on to agenda item 8, which relates to Brunswick Quay uh, on Atlantic Way in Liverpool 3, which is in Riverside Ward. For this item, we have the agent present to deliver a presentation for us. So I would ask my colleague to just put the presentation up on screen to assist. And once that comes on, the agent, Mr. G, if you could unmute your microphone and uh, introduce the presentation. Thank you. Just ask colleagues who, who are not presenting or speaking, please mute your microphones at this stage as well so you don't disrupt the audio feed. Mr. G, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? Thank you. Can you see the slide clearly on, on screen? Uh, I, I can't yet, I'm afraid, no. Okay, it should be coming up very shortly. Right, okay, I've got it. Um, okay, members will uh, be familiar with the, the site's location. It sits on the southern outskirts of the city centre. It's a cleared, barren, former industrial site that has seen no employment use or practically no other use for approximately 20 years or so. Uh, it's unsightly brownfield land. It's one of the last key development opportunities in South Liverpool that flank the river. It's accessed from Atlantic Way to the south. Brunswick Dock itself forms the eastern edge of the site and the river and the, the historic dock gate form the boundary to the west. Uh, slide two, please. Sorry, uh, sorry, can I go back one slide? Right, okay. <laughs> Right, there's, there's, there should be a slide two actually. So if there was a slide two in the presentation. Is it? Doesn't seem to be coming up. Did 
there is a slight time lag, Mr. G, given what you're viewing is the live feed on the website, yeah. as opposed to colleagues on committee are viewing it through Teams, so there is a time delay in what you're seeing. Okay, okay. Um, I could see slide three before, but I'll just, just, just wait for slide two. Just for purpose of clarity, Mr. G, what are you expecting to see on slide two, just so we can go back to the, the correct slide for you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's top left-hand corner. It's, uh, num it's got the number two, and it's entitled History and the Site Today. And there's, and there's an image of a skyscraper on the left-hand side. Hmm. We don't seem to have it transferred in the presentation before us, unfortunately. So, uh, if I can ask you to move on one slide, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, just if I can, if I could talk about what I was going to say for slide two briefly, uh, but you, you, know, you can't see it. It was just simply just uh, to again highlight the uh, point with, with 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 photographs that the site is unsightly and it's brownfield land, uh, not been used for a long time. Just, I'm just picking up on. Uh, I think a couple of objectors have made the point about the negative impact of this scheme on jobs. Um, we don't quite understand that point because this, if, if this is to be approved, it'll it'll sustain around about 200 construction jobs over a period of around about three years during its completion. Uh, the commercial units alone, which form part of the scheme, will generate in the region of 50 to 60 new jobs. So that, that compares to the, the zero jobs that are currently on the site and the zero jobs that have been on the site for the last two decades. Um, I also wanted to make there's, there's no trees or features of any note on the site. There are no listed buildings. It's not in or close to a conservation area. Uh, it falls outside both the World Heritage Site and its buffer zone in a mixed uh, area comprising uh, employment uses, commercial uses, uh, children's play facilities, a go kart racing centre, a hotel. Um, to the immediate north is an established residential area, Cubbis Key, South Kerry Key, Bet South Ferry Key, and uh, new residential developments recently have been approved to the immediate south on Summers Road. Um, the photograph on slide two uh, is also showed the, the condition of the footpath and, and cycle path, the riverside path that runs along the western edge of the site adjacent to the river. Um, it's not a particularly attractive section of path. It's not particularly well, well using, so the people don't tend to loiter there. It's a little bit isolated, uh, narrow and barren. Um, it's, it's the sort of section that I think people prefer to get through quickly rather than spend time. So part of this application is to carry out a very high quality public realm enhancements along that section uh, to make it far more attractive in a place where people will feel safe and will want to spend time. Uh, the site, and this, this was my reference to a skyscraper, uh, the, 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 the members might recall that some years ago in 2006 the, uh, the site was subject to a, a planning application for a 51 storey tower, which uh, following a public inquiry was the inspector actually recommended uh, to be approved, but that decision was ultimately dismissed by the Secretary of State. Um, and my client, who's, who's now on the site for around about 20 years, uh, recognised that skyscraper probably went a little too far. And frankly, some of that height in this location is now unlikely to be viable. So we spent the last 14 years, there's been various attempts to bring uh, something positive forward on the site um, and plenty of positive discussions with your officers. But each time those, those attempts have been scuppered by um, the onset of previous economic recessions until now, um, and, and all of that work has led to the scheme that's now before you. So can we move on to slide three, please. Uh, right, okay, so the inspiration for the design and the layout stems from the maritime uh, Dockland environment, and in particular Liverpool's association with dazzle ships. Um, and for those who are not aware, dazzle ships, and I, I wasn't aware until I got involved in this pro project, uh, dazzle ships, you can see an example at the bottom right, uh, were adorned with a painting technique as a way of camouflaging ships during the First World War. And they usually employed contrasting stripes to create an optical illusion that would break up the ship's shape and obscure its movement in the water. 
which would make it difficult for enemy submarines to destroy it. Uh, and there's a strong connection between Dazzle ships and Liverpool. And some of you might recognize the painting on the bottom left of the slide, which is entitled Dazzle Ships in Dry Dock in Liverpool. And it's a 1919 painting by the artist Edward Wadsworth, whose day job was actually to design camouflage Dazzle ships um, in Liverpool during the war. Anyway, the significance of the Dazzle ship concept from a design point of view is that the buildings have been designed to fade into the background when viewed from a distance, uh, almost as if they are camouflaged. It's also inspired by the historic docks. The proposal will use predominantly natural materials, stone, metal and timber, which will sit well with the context and townscape and reinforce solidity and robustness in, in what is a, a, an exposed location. And on that note, it's worth highlighting that this scheme has been thoroughly tested for its wind microclimate. As you'll see from later images, the architect has introduced layered fragmentation of the material palette with the heavier materials at the base to create a lower visual center of gravity and lighter materials on the upper levels to blur against the sky. Uh, and the ultimate design solution followed no fewer than four pre-application meetings and separate discussions with Historic England, who are very supportive of the whole design.